Hi there, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's APMG webinar in partnership with the Business Relationship Management Institute. In this session, we're looking at cases of effective business relationship management at Rolls-Royce and Loughborough University, and I'm delighted to be joined by representatives from both organisations to share some of their challenges and experiences when implementing BRM practices. My name is Mark Constable, I'm your host and moderator for the session. From Loughborough University, we have Business Relationship Manager Jeremy Byrne, and from Rolls-Royce, we have senior IT business partner, Pez Kuna. Uh, so Jeremy and Pez, it's great to have you both with us today, gentlemen, welcome. And uh, we'll go to Jeremy first for a bit of, uh, about your current role and backgrounds, Jeremy. Hi, uh, yep, yeah, so like uh, Mark was saying, I'm Jeremy, I'm working as a BRM at Loughborough University. I've been here for about 16 years and about six or seven years ago, I helped set up the BRM function. As part, also, as well as that, I work at the Business Relationship Management Institute and voluntary roles and various bits there, vice chair to the leadership team, working on the Knowledge Provision Council and various bits like that. Uh, I've got CBRM and a degree and a master's in relevant areas. And more recently, in the last couple of years, I've started to deliver BRM training, so the BRMP and CBRM for IT winners. Passing over to Pez. Uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone joining on the phone. Um, so, yep, my name is Pez Kuna. Uh, I'm a senior IT business partner within uh, Rolls-Royce Engineering. Uh, I joined Rolls-Royce two years ago, uh, and prior to that, I was a business partner at Birmingham City University, uh, where we helped establish the BRM capability there. Um, so, in total, I've been a formal IT business partner for the best part of around about seven years now. Um, on a voluntary basis, I um, work quite closely with Jeremy uh, and I'm a co-lead of the um, UK Community of Interest Group for BRMI um, and I also hold a BRMP certification too. And then the agenda for today, we're going to be looking at the BRM function and the challenges we've had in getting it kind of set up, getting it going, getting it mature and looking at the value that comes out of it and where we're going next. We've got a rough agenda and various slides to go through, but we're going to keep it quite conversational and do a back bit of to and fro. And if anybody's got any questions as we go along, please ask them and we'll get to them at the end. Thank you. IT was considered a bit of a black box where mm. people would throw projects at us and if they were lucky they came out the other end and if they didn't happen they weren't really sure why or what, what what decisions were being made where by who and for what reasons it was all a bit mysterious um and we also had to kind of get in front of our requests a bit more because we'd find some people would go out and buy software solutions and install them and then tell us rather than even come to us with, with requirements and then we had a bit of problem around kind of relations because we have a bad reputation in some places because we said no to people without much reasoning why and things like that. So we had a, there's a, a clear need for improved relationships and better understanding and kind of, yeah, from the business and IT and that bit going back and forth. And did you, a question for me then, Jeremy, did you ever have a, a kind of an informal function doing that prior to being business partners or BRMs? Yeah, so we had a few people doing it, but not in their job title, in special areas. So the HR and finance department were fine because they had a corporate systems manager who they could talk to, who understood all their needs, they understood, they understood what was coming up in the development plans over the next couple of years. That was very clear, working well. And then those big areas where it's just complete black box, no one was talking to them. They weren't talking to us, we weren't talking to them. Yeah. And they were just completely in the dark. Yeah, I, th I think we had a similar situation at, at Rolls Royce too, where I suppose the need really uh, surfaced in 2017. So so before I, I started, and I was speaking to a colleague of mine who, who lived through the, the journey yesterday, and he was explaining that um, the role itself was probably around at Rolls Royce since around about 2012. Um, uh, in, a, in a very informal capacity, kind of led by business uh, uh, business analysts and lead business analysts. Uh, and by 2017, they'd realised that actually um, Rolls-Royce IT and, and, and the rest of the organisation were kind of on a, a bit of a divergent path, if you like, um, and, and a role um, around the kind of relationship management um, capability was really required to start, to start bringing things together. And again, it's the same as yourself, Jeremy, I think at Rolls-Royce, it was born out of the necessity to to, to you know, really strengthen relationships and stop things um, happening on a whim, 
um, which, which seems to be the case for many organisations, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, and we found the same kind of thing where the, the business and IT tried to work together once every four years when they're doing their four year strategy. Then after they've done that strategy over that one week, that, that one year, then they spend four years going off in completely different directions to then try and pull themselves back together again four years later. Yeah. So thinking about those early days of BRM, back when we set up the functions, uh, well, when I set, helped set up the functions at the university, we we're very much looking at kind of quick wins, trying to build that reputation up so that people didn't see us as just people who said no and did what we thought was best without listening to them. So starting to listen more, starting to understand more and what are they suffering with. Some people have been suffering in silence for years with problems that they just thought they had to live with because nobody really listened or took it on. So we're trying to get those solved for them and get those quick wins and those tactical working going again. And, and for the benefit of everyone on, on call, Jeremy, how many business partners, uh, business relation managers do you have at Loughborough? So there's, there's kind of two of us at this point in the early days. Um, and generally we've got, you know, there's 10 schools, there's 20 professional services, there's a handful of tenants. We've, We've got about 80 different business units to try and get around. Yeah. So we can't physically get around them all. That's why I put on that, that slide there, working where we were wanted, where people are actually open to having these discussions with us will go. Where people put the barriers up and we're like, oh, no, we don't trust you. We don't want to talk to you. Yeah. We wouldn't go. We wouldn't try and force our way in. Let's try and prove our worth elsewhere where we're actually wanted. Yeah. Once we're delivering value there and shown to be working well, and hopefully they'll talk to the people who didn't want us and they'll start opening the doors. And I think I think that's a, a really pertinent point, actually. I think um, for, for anyone who's kind of starting this journey around business relation management or, or business uh, partnering, um, it's important to to kind of identify your quick wins and identify the areas that really need your service. Yeah. Um, it's certainly in my experience. I've found that it only really works where there's a pull and there's a natural mm. gravity um, for, for, for the capability for the service. Yeah, if yeah. you try and be everything to everyone, you become far too stretched and you end up having no value um, to anyone. Um, so I think it's a good point and it's a good way of looking at it is to identify your target areas quickly and, and focus on those. Yeah, and then you've got the point here around HR and finance business partners. So often yeah. that function exists before the IT one, yeah. and then they kind of compare you to them, don't they? They do, and I think we found this at Rolls-Royce. Um, so for, for, as I understand it, the, the HR and IT, uh, HR and finance uh, business partners were long established before and actually held the titles um, before IT, which is, which is um, you know, a bit unusual, I guess, from, certainly from my experience. Um, and, and so that capability was already um, familiarized within, within the organization. Um, I so suppose from a Rolls-Royce perspective, um, we have around about 20 business partners across three business units. Uh, right. So across civil aerospace, defense, uh, and power systems out in Germany. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is that um, although we uh, obviously all work within Rolls-Royce, I think the capability means something slightly different. Yeah, uh, yeah. Depending on the, the, the function and the service that you, that you look after. Um, and I think that's another important point is, um, depending on the complexity of your organization, um, will also dictate the, the kind of the, the benchmark and the, you know, the 80-20 the split of standardization versus customization. Right, yeah. It will, be, it will be varied on the organizational complexity as well, which is what we found in, in Rolls-Royce. Yeah, it makes a difference on how you set that BRM function up, yeah. how you position it. Yeah. And also, as well as kind of going out to the business trying to prove your worth, you've often got to prove your worth internally to IT as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some people don't understand the role and just yeah. think you're going out there drinking coffee and eating cake and chatting. Well, I think, yeah, especially in early days, I think, you know, that is a challenge. And I, yeah. I know that's a challenge that both you and I have had yeah. when we started our respective journeys. Um, but I think, um, you know, there's a there's a maturity conversation there, which I think we'll pick up a bit later on. But um but yeah, it's certainly something to be to be mindful of. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, going on to maturing the BRM function. So once you've got that kind of tactical groundwork done, P 
people are understanding that you are worth talking to, you can get things done, you can solve these long standing issues, then they start to think more longer term and start bringing you into a bit of strategic planning. And often, often we find some business units are a lot more open to this. They, they want to talk, bring you in at early stages because they see that you will help them, that you'll add more value to their strategic plans. You can help steer them. They might have plans to do X and Y, but when you come along, you say, actually, you know, you can go a bit further with that with this new technology that's just coming in. We could do even more. Um, so you can add those, those cherries on top of their plans. Um, we started moving into value management. Um, we do bits of value planning before projects. Right. That tends to happen quite well. Yeah. The benefits realization bit after planning uh, during the projects works quite well. There's checks and balances and things. Sure. Project management is quite rigorous and they've got them in. But after the project's delivered, the benefits realization is a bit hit and miss for us. So, so, so here's a question for you then. Who, who do you think is accountable for benefits realization? Should it be the responsibility of business partners? Or? So according to the theory, it is the business partners. But in practice, we find, well, it's the business partners in conjunction with the business. Because in a way, the business, you and the business have built that business case for that project. They, they've said they wanted it. You've helped them write the business case. You've present, jointly presented it generally. The business might own it. After it's delivered, the business should be accountable for that value which they said they were going to get into their business that you might be responsible for thinking of like the racy matrix here sure. to kind of making it happen and delivering it yeah. and trying to get the people there to actually go and do the checks prove it's worth yeah. things like that yeah no I, I, I tend to agree i think the business do have to take accountability and, and obviously we stand shoulder to shoulder with them right so mm. um so it's important that our partners are you know supported by us um, I think I've seen organisations quite broadly, and I've been speaking to, to, to various colleagues in different organisations, that value realisation falls with the IT project. Yeah. Um, and I the think that's PMO the office. The PMO the, office. Yeah. You go back and report on whether you know you, you've achieved your goals. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a, a bit of a dated way of looking at things. I think. Yeah, I think so. And our, our PMO office got told to not do that because of the huge backlog in projects. Yeah. They should focus on delivering the projects rather than focusing on the writing up reports and doing benefits checks after they've delivered. Yeah. And it's seen that we know that the benefits are being delivered because the business unit's now functioning better and yeah. more efficiently and yeah. delivering the extra bits that they can. Yeah. And, and digressing a bit, um, but I think it's an interesting, interesting conversation to have around when you become a business relationship manager and IT business partner, uh, and by the way, I'll use those terms interchangeably. And if anyone's <laughs> joining from the States, and they'll be confused, but in the UK, generally we use IT business partner as uh, another word for BRM or business relationship manager. Um, so excuse me if I if I use the terms interchangeably. But um, it could be strategic engagement partners as well. You know, there's all kinds of different, yeah, different job all titles, all sorts of different there. job titles. But um, in terms of becoming a IT business partner. Um, certainly we found at Rolls-Royce before I joined, uh, there's around about 20 business partners as I said across the organization. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of them, I think if not all to start with, came through internally. Um, right. So there wasn't anyone coming from industry or a, you know, a seasoned business partner, if you like, um, with, with a tagline to follow. Um, and I think a lot tend to come from either a program, a project management or a program management or a, yeah. a, a business enterprise architect um, or even a business analyst roles. Um, and conversely, you get the other side of the spectrum when a, a lot of BPs come from the business or the, the support areas like you know, HR moving into IT and, and what have you. Yeah, I think, yeah, generally it's more people within IT moving up than coming yeah. from, from the business into IT. Um, and do you think some of the behaviours around um, talk about value management there? And if mm. you're a project manager, for example, going into a, a BRM role, do you think it's important to to kind of recollaborate your thoughts, if you like, to make sure that you don't bring all of the technical aspects of your role into business relationship management, or do you think they play an important part? Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of kind of baggage you can bring with you which could be a bit detrimental because you're a bit too set in your ways and you need to kind of 
break out of some of those shackles and think of the kind of bigger picture and a bit, a bit freer and looser and uh, sometimes but yeah I came from a kind of a technical background of you know fiddling around with servers and things like that yeah. um, which is good because it gives me a technical understanding of what's possible although now it was seven eight years ago it's completely out of date probably so it doesn't really bear much relevance but at least i can kind of understand still what the technical people are talking about when they go into that those steps yeah. but yeah so yeah it's interesting when you think about project managers who might be quite rigid and strict in kind of you no know, this is the procedure you've got to follow it and fill out these forms and do it in this way you're spot on and, and i think um you know uh, again going back to the rules royce history of it um speak to my colleague yesterday and, and he gave me a picture actually <laughs> of all the people who started off on the journey in 2017 as business relationship managers yeah. and then he'd marked uh, an x on their face like an agatha christie kind of suspense who's oh, next yeah. kind of thing and it was fascinating to see that only a handful of those individuals are actually still business partners now um, mm -hmm. because as they understood the role and they kind of got to understand what the accountabilities and the responsibilities were of being a business partner it just wasn't for them yeah um, you know and, and they decided to either go back into their relevant technical expertise or move organization i think it's an important point um because you see it so often that people see it business partner as a as an extension to a to a project manager or a yeah or a, a business analyst when in actual fact the skill sets can be very different and it's important to, to acknowledge and recognize that. Yeah, it's not just high level business analysis, it's not just pre-project work, just a bit of planning and things like that. There's so much more to it and there's, that's why it's important to get those kind of roles really well defined when you're setting out the function, especially to stop you treading on each other's toes as the project managers, the enterprise architects of, you know, where, where does one role end and another one start? Also, make sure you encompass all of the VRM function and what it what it entails. So, like you say, you don't get people starting thinking they're going to be doing pre-project and a bit of value planning when really they've got to do a lot of other bits as well. And, and I think that's where. So, so again, coming back to to, to kind of my points there um, around kind of training and baseline in the role is so important, and especially if you've got quite a lot of business partners in in your organisation across different sectors, like we have. Um, so when I joined, one of the things that we we consciously decided to do with the leadership team was try and introduce a bit of training, yeah. um, which we hadn't had formal training, certified training uh, as, a, as a, an organization for. I had it from my previous organization about five, six years ago. But um, the reason why we, we took on the, the kind of the BRMP training was to just to provide that baseline of understanding. Um, yeah, it's I, been getting the language right, isn't it, as well? It makes sure yeah. everyone's using the same terminology, the same language, the exactly. same I mean, role and scope it, you know it's it, obviously it's not the silver bullet and you know no. a lot of it you don't get to actually implement or it takes a lot of time and effort to implement but i think what it does do is gives you the opportunity as an organization to have a common ground amongst business relationship managers yeah yeah um which i think you know is, is is quite important otherwise you will end up having some people having the title of a business partner end up doing a project manager's role yeah uh, or an architect's role and no one's actually focusing on what's important for, for the function yeah i found that when i've delivered the brmp training i found people take it and then go oh we're going to just re slightly relaunch our brm function now now that we know we can define it in this way or we know where the lines are and the barriers are and things like that we can redefine it and relaunch it i think we relaunched our brm function about three times <laughs> in the past seven years i think just as we define it and tweak it and try and get it right and position it correctly. So I've got another question for you, Jeremy. I'm full of questions today. Yeah. Um, a bit about that, that second slide on, on, on the, towards, the, towards the end, um, about doing what's needed for the organization and, and the maturity model. So yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of listeners have, will have seen um, a, a maturity model where you've got kind of ad hoc all the way to strategic partner. Um, is there, a, is there a silver bullet, do you think, for, for that? Or do, do you have to be in a specific area? No, I think yeah, there's, there's no way that you're going to be strategic partner to all business units, even if you're the best business partner in the world, following every best practice and guideline. At some point, people need the tactical stuff still. And they don't want to have to talk to three different people, one person's tactical, one's strategic, one's this, one for that. 
they want to talk to you as your business partner. I mean, you're not the single point of contact, yeah. but you're the single point of focus as they go into the theory. But And it's true, they do want that single point of focus when they come to you. They will be up and down the scale as well. One minute, they're strategic, you know, then the next week, something's going wrong, they need to talk tactical. I think the main area we try to get to and stay in is that trusted advisor, that yep. level four, so that if they're thinking of doing something, they want to run it past you and double check with you. You're their advisor, to, you know, helping guide them, give them that yeah. input ready. Yeah, I think I, I probably learned the hard way when I started uh, being a, a business partner. When, when we established this at Birmingham City University a few years ago, uh, we really had the, the kind of set out our stall following all the theory. We're trying to be here strategic. Yeah. We, we want to do things the right way. And, tell me your five-year you know, plan. Tell me your five-year <laughs> plan. And, you know, we're, we're going to sort the world out. And it was such an eye-opener. You know, within literally two months, we realized, actually, it's just not where the conversations are. You know, this yeah. is like building a house. It, yeah. You know, you, you're going to have to start with a tactical, build your credibility, um, and then slowly work up. And the reality is, I think after seven years of doing it, the truth is, is that you can be anywhere on that spectrum in any given day. Yeah. Um, it just depends on what the organization requirements are at the time. Sometimes you have to be hands on. Uh, sometimes you have to be strategic, but that forms part of your skill set. But I think the biggest takeaway that I've taken away um, is being accountable. Yeah. And holding that in that relationship. Um, you know, if someone comes to you with a help desk style problem, it's not about saying go away and sort it out. It's about showing them the right way of doing things. Uh, yeah. You know, explaining that you know you have to raise the call, and if you raise the call, they're not going to have to do an escalation point. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I think the, the the kind of wrong attitude to have is it's not me. You know, it's too ad hoc. I'm strategic. Mr. Yeah, strategic yeah. partner over here, or Mrs. Strategic I'm not partner. Not talking to you here. about that. Talking to you about that. <laughs> I think that's one sure way of of, of really damaging your own credibility uh, and losing. And losing trust with your with your partners. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll take a phone call from any of them about anything. But you know, if I'm just saying, oh yeah, you just need to submit that to the service desk. That's just a service desk case. You know, your laptop's broken. Yeah, you can tell me about it, but I'm, I'm still going to tell you to submit it to the service desk. But if you're phoning me up telling me that, you know, ten times in ten weeks, then I think there's a bigger problem. The service desk might just be patching it up. Yeah. And then that comes into going back into the kind of idle side of things, problem management. And if that's not being done well, you you can often pick up that role as a BRM yeah. for doing problem management where oh yeah, we've, we're putting all these tickets to the service desk and they are solving them, but should we be having this many tickets? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of thing. And, and I think that's where your kind of, um, your wider holistic view of, of, of the IT service becomes so important because it's your ability to spot those trends and to bring those tech trends to the fore. So you are advocating change, which is, um, you know, not about just the problems, but taking a step back and looking at the, the entirety of the issue mm. uh, and, and reporting and trying to solve it um, accordingly. But do you find yourself becoming a gap filler for any lack in service management within IT? So if there isn't a problem management function, if there isn't yep. a service delivery manager looking at those kind of medium term problems and get things do you find yourself falling into those gaps it does it does i mean we're to be fair we're we're quite lucky um at rolls royce we've got a dedicated service manager who works with us uh, as part of our extended teams uh, part of the business engagement team who who helps kind of take some of that stuff away yeah. but it doesn't stop our partners from you know Sometimes it's just being lazy, being honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and sometimes genuinely they don't understand the process, um, and we help them through that. So there is a bit of gap filling. Mm. But to be honest, I think as you as you mature your relationship, um, it should become less and less um, to the point where it becomes a rarity and not the norm. Yeah, yeah. The trouble is when you fill that gap so well that they don't want to point somebody into that gap. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. And, and and this is you know what 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 my manager kind of always says is is, is call it out. Yeah, it's so important to call things out, and you know, not just absorb. Yeah, you know, I'm doing this. It's not technically my job role, but I'm yeah. filling the gap. And, and, and where you need support, yeah, you go back into the IT organisation and say, "This is a gap, guys. We need to fill it. I'm yeah. not going to fill it forever." Um, and, and then follow through on that. Um, otherwise, yeah, you become a bit of a waste bin. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for for all things that someone else can't solve. Yeah, and that's another reason why you need to kind of document the roles and responsibilities of the BRM yeah. and where that where one 
function ends and another one begins like PMO, enterprise architecture, business analysts, problem managers. Correct. All of that. And, and one of the things that we've done at Rolls-Royce to help that uh, as a team is um, we've created six services. So we've defined right. our services as a business engagement team. So when I say business engagement team, we have a team of uh, business partners, um, uh, business enterprise architects. We have um, a, a bit of a PMO office and also program managers as well. And yeah. collectively, we're known as, as the business engagement team for civil aerospace. Um, and what we did last year, towards the end of last year, we very consciously decided that actually we need to be very clear and articulate in terms of what services we provide as a, as a team. Yeah. Um, so we collectively came came up with six services um, around you know, your, your general BRM competencies, so things like communicate and advise, um, controlling investments, um, improving the digital workplace, so things that are important, but we felt that we needed to make sure they're documented and, and understood. And, and then you're accountable for those areas. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so we kind of take responsibility in making sure that our customers understand those. Yeah. Um, so they've got a clear picture of, of what we can provide and we're not just a, an extension of the help desk. Yeah, so we've, we've done something similar. We created a wider business partnering team, which includes our IT directors, the people above us in the hierarchy, uh, people alongside us, like um, different kind of team managers, enterprise architects, PMO managers, anyone who goes out of IT and talks to people in the business directly, apart from kind of support, um, are in this wider business partnering group. And we just get together once a month and just share everything that we found out and say, right, I've been to talk to these people. They're talking about this. They're heading this direction. Oh, you know, this business unit is going to restructure. They're going to merge with this other business unit or they're going to break up into smaller pieces, something like that. Any, anything we find out, we then share because then we often find out that somebody else has spoken to somebody else and they've got similar things. We start joining up those dots. So it's important to have a and again, this is another facet which a lot of people don't appreciate is your personal network within an organization yeah. and how important it is. Um, I think my colleagues who are on the line and they'll, they'll keep me true through the comment section, I'm sure. But um, a lot of our businesses, what we do um, is reliant on the people that we know. Yeah. Uh, and, and the kind of the, the, the corridor conversations or the, yeah, the, uh, the unofficial the unofficial communication channels are so, so important to yeah. become successful because Without that, you do tend to miss a lot of the subtleties or the grey areas um, that don't get picked up through the the official channels, if you like. Yeah, and that's especially important at the university where everyone's been here for like 15, 20, 30 years. Sometimes yeah. people come here to work and they never leave. Yeah. So they build up all kinds of relationships over those years with all yeah. kinds of people. Yeah. It's really important to kind of, like say, like harness and bring them all together and share. Yeah, and, and I think on that point, I think it's, it's on our 12th list of tips um, around understanding the political landscape yeah. of your organization. And I think this is where a lot of BRM um, deployments tend to fail or not fail or kind of, you know, that don't embed as quickly as they'd hoped is you have to understand that a lot of what you're dealing with is dealing with the gray. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's not like a it's not black and white. Is it's it not black and white? And, and I think that's what separates um, us um, from from perhaps most of the other technical side of IT um, is that we have to navigate through that grey. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of people struggle with that. I've seen the especially technical people, 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 people of technical background, exactly. You know, struggle with the greyness. Struggle with the greyness, <laughs> and I think um, there's a lot in that greyness that will ultimately dictate where your relationship goes with your partnering area. You know, if you can manage that grey, understand the political landscape of your organisation, know who the power players are, you know, dabble in the dark arts if you like, yeah, yeah. too Machiavellian, but um, you have to be mindful of that. Do you do um, stakeholder mapping where you go through your different kind of stakeholders in the business units and mark them as whether they're kind of powerful and uh, we have them. decision makers and things like them. that? Yeah, we have them. Um, but I think it's go on. I think these things are best treated as a very personal. Yeah, uh, I think uh, when we've looked at it, it, yeah, it can it can just be a personal opinion. It can go out of date so quickly. That's Sometimes right. it's it's good for a new starter coming in to help them understand. Oh, by the way, that person over there, yeah. they're really important. That's right. Try not to upset them, right. handle them in this way, or right. you know, absolutely. And I think. The best stakeholder map you can create is through your own personal experience and personal interaction because mm. 
I certainly found some people have struggled with certain stakeholders. Yeah. I've gone in and I find them dead easy to work with. Vice versa, I've yeah. struggled with partners and someone else has come in and done a fantastic job. So it all depends on your own personality as well. Exactly, yeah. And how well you can re relate to someone. So I think, although it's important as a self-reflection tool, um, it, it's also dangerous. You know, if it gets into the wrong hands, it can be quite a dangerous um, yeah. uh, piece of yeah. documentation. Dif yeah, difficult to document, difficult to keep up to date, and then, yeah, could do more harm than good if it Indeed. <laughs> goes to the wrong people. Indeed. Right, moving on to the next. Slide reporting for and value. Now I know you've got some thoughts on this, but I do. We we try to report the value a bit internally within IT to help people understand what we're doing and why you know why it's important. So we do it in a couple of ways. We do a there's a monthly report we send out which highlights all the kind of new proposals that are coming in, the new ideas that we've picked up what the latest status is on it and this is generally things which we discuss at that wider business partnering group with the kind of senior people who go out and talk to people but it kind of gets summarized in a report and sent out to all IT staff once a month and then we get people contacting us going oh I see you're looking at you know replacing all the till systems and over you know and the shops over there oh did you know that they've also got tills in this area down here have you thought about that and so you, you kind of pick up extra bits of information it helps that and it helps everyone understand. So it's not too much of a kind of trumpet blowing, look at us, we're doing lots of work over here, honest, we're not just drinking coffee and eating cake. Um, it does help kind of get everyone's input into this new stuff before it happens, before it kind of gets officially approved and in the project pipeline or delivered as a service or a change. Yeah. Um, so we do that and we also try and highlight We've started trying to record and then highlight everything we've stopped early. So internally within IT, we're getting a reputation that you just bring us more work. You just go out there and bring us more and more projects, more and more work. We've got a whole backlog to deal with. Just slow it down. It's like, so we're starting to try and report back and say, no, look, we've stopped all these projects happening. We've stopped all these requests coming into you. Because yeah. we've caught them. We've realized that there's not enough value there to justify it. Yeah. We've stopped it early. Or we've joined it up, so we've got five requests and we've now got one because we've caught it early, joined them all together, said, now look, you're going to get 80% of what you want, but we're going to do it once rather than everyone's going to get 100% of what they want, but we have to do it five times. So we're lowering their expectations a bit, joining them up and delivering once, reducing the complexity of IT, reducing the workload. So we try and do bits of that, but yeah. <laughs> So, so I think that's a good way of doing it. So, because what you're doing there is you're defining the term value as value to the business. So, you know, as yeah. a result of your actions, what is changing in terms of in terms of the needle? What I take, um, go on. Um, what can what gets under my skin? Um, so, I hear a lot of um, business partnering functions or business partners um, talk about the importance of documenting the value of the business partner within the organization yeah um, primarily to and, and the, the term and i've used this in the past as well when i started to you know if you have a new change of director or there's a, a change in leadership team how would you document your value and prove your worth um, in terms of your function and that kind of gets under my skin a bit because i feel now that as a profession we should be mature enough for people to understand or have a level of understanding about the value that we bring as business relationship managers. I'm not talking about individuals, but as a, as a, as a function. function, as yeah. a function. Uh, just in, in the same way that you wouldn't necessarily question um, developers or you wouldn't question um, assistant directors or even the CIO. Well, yeah. Um, you I was going to say for developers, you could question them. I guess you, you could, yeah, could yeah, outsource well, them. You could, yeah, well, well they can't outsource relationship managers. Like they, it's a lot, a lot of it is based on yeah. knowledge. Um, but, but my point is, is that, you know, we have to get away from this mindset of creating value and documents to justify our own roles. Yeah. Because I think if you do that, then if a leadership change happens, guarantee they'll probably look at that and say, well, actually, we're probably better off getting rid of you anyway, because uh, yeah. <laughs> you're clearly more interested about saving your own job than doing what's right for the organization. So, yeah, I think it's important to document value, um, but the value has to be valuable to the partner. 
uh, not just valuable to yourself and yeah. trying to save your job. Because so most of ours has been documenting value internally to IT, yes. but for the business, we don't really do anything like that because generally we they get the value from talking to us and getting things done that they want and sure. they see it and they yeah. get it through having their meetings with us. So we don't need to go to them with a report saying, look at everything we've done in the past year, aren't we great? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so we do we do something slightly slightly different. Um, so um, at the bottom there, you've got quarterly delivery plans. So um, at the moment in Rolls Royce, um, there's obviously cash constraints as with all organisations. Um, so we're having to be very very clear and careful in terms of our investment propositions going forward and making sure that um, things are prioritised accordingly based on the value that that they give. So yeah, one of the things that we're we're doing is uh, quarterly delivery roadmaps. Okay. Um, and it sounds a bit program managerish, which it is. Yeah. Um, but what we do is we work with the product teams within IT and with the, the business team sponsoring the relevant projects and, and programs um, and document the benefits um, from a capability perspective, which are going to be um, introduced every quarter through the year. So it's a very yeah. kind of, um, high level image on, on one page, which just says that in January 2020, you can expect this as a capability. This is not just about saying, or oh, you, know, you can expect Office 365, because to, to the average person, that means nothing. No, yeah, yeah. But if I was you know, to say to you, well, actually, from January 2020, you will now have the ability to um, share documents, share documents collaborate about externally, and externally. Uh, it means something different yeah, yeah. To, our, to our partners. So that's what we've started doing, and it's it's been quite successful. Are you matching that up with all the kind of the struggles and the requirements and the suffering people have had over the years, and then kind of like ticking them off? On this quarter, we're solving that problem that you said. Correct. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. where our measurements come in. So by kind of helping articulate what IT are delivering in that way, which makes sense to the partners, to to, to our kind of customers, if you like, it helps. Um, Kind of demystify IT a bit because actually they can see what yeah what's the tangible outcome I'm getting from, yeah, yeah. from from so it's a bit tactical, but it is very impactful because you start to build a lot of credibility by by sharing that through through your interactions at, at your with your partners, um, and then longer term we have um, so we were as I said we work quite closely with the business enterprise architects so we right. architects aligned to our portfolio, um, and what we're doing is we're creating a capability roadmaps right. So as long as have as well as having that kind of uh, yearly view with the quarterly roadmaps, we're also then trying to map the capability requirements over the course of say three years. Right. Okay. Um, so once we've understood that with the business of what capabilities are required, we can then work with the IT technical teams to understand well actually how does that match with the product roadmap? Yeah. yeah. What what can we expect to service these requirements, these capabilities that we need to, to satisfy business objectives? And, and that becomes a really good way of starting the conversation through the business lens, not through a technical lens. Right, yeah. So how do you work out prioritization in that case then? So um, conflicting capabilities or? So that's a whole different <laughs> activity that we do. And for, for Rolls-Royce colleagues on the phone, I'm talking about the ATS process, but we have a yearly investment cycle um, right. process. So uh, that's where we kind of do our business cases and justification. Um, but the great thing is, is that once we've got the um, the kind of capability roadmaps set out per hour functions in a in a silo, if you like, yeah. The idea of the business enterprise architect then is to look at all of these capability roadmaps and look for commonality. Right. Oh, okay. So you know, so say for, for example, your your area that you look after wants, um, I'll use Office 365 again, and there's a clear capability of cloud collaboration, uh, document collaboration. Yeah. I've got the same. Our colleagues got the same. The business enterprise architects then have that capability of actually saying, well, actually, this is replicated in three or four different areas. Clearly, this capability requires um, some attention, which will then feed into the investment process right. kind of to energize and make sure that we've got the, the relevant priorities in place. But it's a lot more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> need more than the last 10 minutes or so that we've got to go through it with you. But it feeds, it feeds part of it, for sure. Okay. So what's next for... BRM, your BRM function, what have you got kind of planned for the future? Um, are you growing, trying to get more BRMs and expand, or are you trying to focus more on 
specific areas? Or? Yeah, so I think, um, so as an organization, we're going through um, a lot of transformation. So there's yeah. a lot of transformation programs kicking off this year into next year. Um, and our focus is really on realizing those those right. transformation programs. So we're not really looking oh, at okay. kind of more, we're not really looking at the three to five year roadmap. Trying to deliver, deliver the deliver. current. Right. Exactly, happen, yeah. We, we, know, we know we've got a lot to deliver uh, in the right. immediate future. So I think from a business partnering perspective, we're really focused on making sure that requirements are understood from an IT perspective, the business has got the resources lined up to, to help deliver that activity. So we're almost playing that gatekeeper role. Right. Uh, chairman, I think our, our CDIO, he refers it to as chairmanship. Yeah, so he, the gatekeeper's a bit negative. Yeah, gatekeeper's a bit negative, <laughs> more chairmanship and kind of um, making sure that you're the, you know, you're the sensible party in, 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 in projects and programs yeah. that can kind of spot, you know, potential pitfalls or opportunities. Yeah. Being that I mean, unbiased viewpoint, isn't it? Exactly. Being that trusted advisor Being again. Going trusted advisor, that exactly. Um, so, so a lot of our focus is on that. Um, right, yeah. we, we, we have expanded our business um, relationship management capability um, because, you know, again, it's based on the business need. Um, yeah. you know, if we think we need it, we'll, we'll go there. One thing it's definitely not doing is, um, is contracting. Um, you know, I think there's, the more that we've gone out and um, proved our worth by doing, the more demand pull there has been on our on our services. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, that's another point um, which is probably worth making is in order for relationship management to work, there has to be a pull from your partnering organisation. Yeah. There has to be. Yeah. Because they have to want it. it. They have to want it. And if they don't, it just becomes a fruitless task because you might do a bit of tactical work for them. Yeah. But the conversation never really matures from there. And that's absolutely fine because obviously each area will have different requirements. The one piece of advice I would give to, to kind of um, people who are starting on this journey is that don't beat yourself up if relationships don't work straight away. It's not about badge collecting and making sure that every single relationship is a strategic partner. No, yeah. You know, invest your time wisely because there's only one of you at the end of the day. If you're lucky, there might be a couple of you. Yeah. Um, but but the reality is is that you need to have faith in your own ability um, and you know really put your effort where where you know you can you can make the maximum impact uh, and call out the areas which you know which may not be uh, ready for for business partnering. Yeah. Cool. yourself. Well, yeah, we're trying to expand, refocus a bit. Um, like I said, we've got various people doing the role unofficially so we're trying to make some of that a bit more official getting the people who do business partnering but aren't business partners to follow some more standardized approaches and share more and things like that so we're just trying to bring that more together as we grow and expand and yeah just working more as that trusted advisor yeah. uh i've been doing some work recently on customer journey mapping oh yeah so we're going to the business unit and then whatever their customer is. So as well as doing education, teaching and learning, we've got hotel and conferences, for, for example. They did customer journey mapping for people coming and delivering conferences here. What's their interactions like with the company? How does that work? What's their experience like? And I help facilitate this customer journey mapping exercise with a view of IT, where's the IT interaction? For them to then build a digital strategy and digital transformation series of projects to improve that customer experience over the coming years so yeah. we've been doing a bit of that research it's been really interesting so that's moving into a bit more of the strategic side of things with people as well as as you know keeping that tactical side keep Indeed. going and rolling Indeed. um but yeah so we better move on and just see if we've got any questions so should we hand back over to mark yeah, thank you guys. Uh, really interesting stuff. Um, we've got uh, a few questions to kick off with and just looking at the time, we've got a uh, good 10 minutes or so for questions. So I'll start with this one, which came in fairly early in the presentation, coming back to how you're aligned to the business. is. Um, uh, so can I ask how you were aligned to the business? Was it on a one-on-one -on -one basis with a, a particular division or department or some other um, approach? Okay, um, so from, from as, as a Rolls-Royce perspective, um, so as a senior business partner uh, and my colleagues, we're aligned to um, 
individuals on the executive leadership team. So they call it CELT, uh, Civil, Aerospace, uh, Civil Aerospace Leadership Team. Um, so for, for each of the functions, if you like, we're kind of aligned to to each CELT member. Um, so so yeah, we're, we're kind of, uh, we have that interaction with the CELT member, but then often we work quite closely with their first line. Um, so our positioning, if you like, is, is fairly senior in the organization. Um, Purely um, because that's where that's where the, the kind of need is, is is at present. Jeremy, yeah, for us we have kind of a primary and backup type situation generally. So there's, there's, there's mainly there's two of us who do this kind of full time as our job role, and there'll be certain ones where we're the primary and the other ones the backup and vice versa. And generally that's the ones who we've got the historical relationship with. We've got that kind of bond and that trust which has been built up over the years. Yeah, and that's that's why it really works. But they know that we're not a single point of contact. Yeah. If we're not around, you can talk to the other one or you can talk to somebody else and yeah. we'll pick it back up when we're back in and things like that. Yeah, and likewise, I think um, just because you're positioned in a certain way doesn't mean that you don't talk to anybody else in the organization um, because I think it's important that you know within the functions that you support. So for example, I support, support large engine programs uh, and also the um, corporate functions within civil aerospace, so your finances and your HRs and, and general counsel. And um, quite often I find that the the meat, if you like, is often, you know, it, it kind of into the more operational side of, uh, of those of those functions. Yeah. Um, so it's important to keep an ear and kind of connections through um, throughout the org structure that you support really. But in terms of one to one alignment, um, you know, it's obviously through through the leadership team of the areas that we support. Okay. Mark, any more? Thanks, guys. Um, yep, yep, plenty more. Um, so I know you did a piece on reporting value, and I think this one came in just before that. The question is, though, a bit specific to IT. How did you prove your worth to IT? Well, I kind of, I kind of went through that briefly. So we try and highlight all the things we stop early. We try and join up requests so we don't get multiple requests asking for the same thing. We get one request with multiple stakeholders behind it. Um, and then we share all the information that we get as early as possible. So we're a completely open book, transparent function. We try and share and tell everyone everything that we find out as much as possible, unless it's kind of sensitive, you know, if there's a restructure and possible redundancies in the business unit, then obviously we won't be able to share that. But every, everything and anything that we can share, we do for a monthly report. Doors always open for conversation, things like that. What about you, Fab? Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on how your organization is structured as well. Um, so, for example, we have um, kind of two IT or multiple IT um, divisions within Malls Royce. So, you have a central IT function within Group GBS, uh, sorry, Group Business Services. Uh, and we actually kind of hardwire into the, the civil aerospace route. So, a lot of the, the kind of technical doing is done by Group IT, um, and we kind of manage that relationship on behalf of civil. So, we kind of have a, a an accountability divide, if you like, across the two the two areas. Um, so, so yeah, it's, in terms of kind of our importance back into IT and how we report that, I think at, most of ours is done through the investment um, vehicle that I was talking about. Um, so, we are responsible and accountable for making sure that the investments are are kind of understood um, and prioritised accordingly, so that the central IT team have a clear backlog um, of work to do. Um, so our value really kind of hits home when we have those conversations um, with with IT and business colleagues um, to uh, to understand what the requirements are and what we need to do from a solution delivery point of view. So although we don't do any formal metrics back into IT, if you like, I think the, the value is kind of, um, kind of there. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um Ian asked if you've looked at uh, formalizing relationships using relationship mapping techniques um, for example the quality versus importance of an individual or department relationship um, he said says that's worked well for him in the past well so what doing doing the mapping exercise here we, we have done it in the past but we do find it is a bit subjective it can go out of date it's quite useful to do once in a while just to kind of reassess um, well I've, I've done it it's probably been more useful when I've done it at a kind of business unit level where we talk, go through and assess them and think, right, are they coming to us early with requests? Are they coming to us with business problems 
or are they coming to us with technical solutions? Mm. And by analyzing when they come to us, what kind of questions they're asking us, of us, we work out roughly how mature that relationship is. And then we work out whether it's somewhere we want to focus on improving. So we do that as a kind of a relationship maturity gap analysis piece once a year on business unit level. Yeah. On the individual stakeholders, I was saying that it's a bit subjective, it's a bit personal. We've got an idea and with the two of us in Loughborough being the main full-time BRMs, we just chat and share all the time anyway, so we, we know what, where each other stands on everything. Once you get into bigger groups, then sometimes you might benefit more from documenting and sharing. What about you? Ben? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I think um, if you're looking at it from a functional perspective, um, then certainly there is merit in doing that um, kind of on a, on a frequent or a semi-frequent basis. Um, can't say that we do anything in particular in that space. Um, you know, obviously we'll have conversations, um, an informal understanding and idea of where our relationships are. Um, one of the things I have done in the past, though, is um, a kind of a relationship maturity assessment with the business. Uh, and I think that's probably in the, the BRMI text, I think, from what I remember. Where uh, yeah, it's part of the training a bit. You can you can kind of have a um, it's a it's a kind of a tool set which you can use with, especially in failing um, relationships. It's actually quite helpful, and I've seen that being used where you can kind of have that assessment conversation with 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 the area and trying to figure out where where their thinking's at and where your thinking's at and try and meet them in the middle. So again, a bit more personal um with with the function. Um but I don't think we do anything anything more formal. Yeah. Okay, thanks guys. Uh next question, are there any particular tools you use to help support the reporting? We've got uh we've got few different tools we use. So we've got an internal uh, CRM tool, which is it's based off Zoho CRM. The only reason we use Zoho is because it's highly configurable. Most CRM systems are all about sales, leads, targets, and our function obviously isn't in that area. So we got Zoho because we could rename and delete all the bits that we want to do relatively easily. And we use that to track engagements, proposals, ideas, and any kind of concepts that people come up with through to getting it approved and then it gets passed over to our PMO office to deliver. But as part of this kind of engagement tracking tool that we use, we can export reports and that's the monthly report we email around to the IT department and say, this is everything that's going on at the minute. Because we're tracking it all in this tool, it's easy to export that monthly report and send it around to everybody. Um, apart from that, there's a couple of kind of Excel spreadsheety based tools which we use to do some kind of relationship gap analysis and relationship maturity modeling. Um, but we tend to do that kind of once a year just to check where we are on track and if there's any gaps we should be focusing on and readjust. What about yourself? Yeah, yeah we're, we're fairly low low tech in that sense. Um, so uh, again, yeah, we obviously we've got spreadsheets um, and, and various spreadsheet based tools. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that we've found really helpful um, is Microsoft Teams. Um, right. Yeah. We started using Microsoft Teams a bit more now, especially the planner functionality. Um, yeah. So kind of to, to manage tasks and understand where bits are. It's very helpful with um, situations like um, you know if, if one of you are going on leave or extended break, it's having you know, one of your colleagues across you. You work in fairly siloed. You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very siloed. Um, so it's good to have that documented in a in a clear way where someone can come in and, and see what you're working on. Yeah. And pick up a relationship and understand, you know, some key key items on on, on what you're what you're doing. Um, but yeah, apart from that, we don't use anything like Zoho. Uh, yeah. well, we also use our ticketing system. Within that, we've yeah. got a kind of a cloud services request process, right? Which comes through business partnering to kind of validate and approve, as well as before you move on to doing security and information governance checks. Yeah. But we kind of own that process in, in its entirety, so it comes to us to talk to them around what they're trying to do, why do they want to use this cloud service, and then we push it through. So that's all managed in our ticketing system. Yeah, we, we're, we um, you know, as, as you said, I just realised that we're, we're actually moving to um, more mature reporting from a portfolio perspective as well. Um, right. So there's going to be, um, we're moving to a provider who I don't think I can name yet, but um, essentially we're trying to get that report that you referred to um, a bit more crisper um, yeah. um, and we're moving to a new tool which will enable us to keep an accurate track on projects, portfolios, um, so we can then pull off those reports 
and, and have that, that single consistent view um, mm. across what we're trying to deliver. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, that's one is, I think we've got time for probably two more questions. Uh, so the next one is, do you often find yourselves right in the middle of conflict between business and IT, especially when it isn't on the strategic roadmap? Uh, what are your thoughts, guidance around managing this, uh, especially being in a role where we're constantly having to mediate two entirely valid points of view? Your ne a word of advice for the person who's asked that question, um, something that my old CIO told me, you're never the friend of the business or you're never the friend of IT in this role. Um, and although it's a bit tongue in cheek, I think there is an element of that, is that you do have to hold tension. Yeah, you're that unbiased person in the middle who's thinking of the bigger picture. You're not trying to benefit IT, you're not trying to benefit the business unit, you're trying to benefit the organisation as a whole. Right. So you can get pulled in either direction, you, don't you? You can, and I think the, the important piece is, um, depending on the scenario, obviously, I think what you have to remember is um, what the scale of the ask is. You know, if it's someone asking for an iPad, for example, which I've had in the past, and IT have been really digging the heels and saying, we're not going to have I iPads on the estate, and the, this executive dean saying, yeah, no, I want an iPad, and I'm not going to do anything until I get my iPad. You have to really be objective and say, well, actually, at what point is it worth losing a relationship over? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of do what's best for business. Uh, and I think that's where your skill set's really going to come to the, to the fore, is that you will have to put your head above the parapet and and make a stance on, yeah. on, on, what, you, it, on what you believe. It's being transparent and true and yeah. just saying, you know, this is the reason I'm making this decision or I'm supporting this viewpoint because I believe it's got greater value than the other viewpoint for these reasons yeah. you know there that's all my justification it's all out in the open and that's why I'm yeah. choosing that way and if you want to choose the other way then you make your case and you know I might change my mind or we might be able to convince them to change their mind but it's just yeah, you've just got to stay open transparent and true yeah. and, and just yeah yeah and sometimes try and just go for it that's right <laughs> Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, one final question, um, probably more one for you, Jeremy, as the, as the BRM trainer. Um, but how do we convince more senior staff that the business partnership BRM role uh, requires a professional training and standards rather than just relying on what we already know? I think it's like we were saying earlier, it, it gives everyone that kind of baseline. It, it helps you position the function. Everyone's using the correct language terminology. You can kind of Put the function so that you know where you end and PMO and enterprise architecture begin. You can get more value out of the role if you've got the training and accreditation. I just think it's, you know, you may as well take these best practices that people have, hundreds of people have inputted into develop, view it all, and then take the bits out which work for you. It's not where you have to do it in its entirety and take every single thing which they say in the theory and implement it. It's just giving you an overview about all these best practices that have been inputs in from around the world and you get to pick and choose all the best bits to implement for yourself. So, yeah, I just think, yeah, it's really valuable and really good and I'm not just saying that. <laughs> yeah, I think um, on that, um, very briefly, I think we're, again, coming back to this thing about we're no different to, to any other IT profession now. You know, so if you're a project manager, you'd probably want to do Prince or, yeah. or managing successful programs, um, you know, this is just another tool kit in the arsenal um, to, to, to draw upon. And um, I think as, as the as the capability matures in the UK, um, I think more and more people are looking for some kind of um, baseline training. Um, and it, to be honest, it's useful because not a lot of people are seasoned business relationship managers by title yet. I think we're still mm. maturing on that curve. Yeah, it's still new. Um, so it's still new. So it's important to have some kind of um, reference point to to, to fall back on. Excellent. Thanks very much, guys. And I'm conscious we are just slightly running over our time now, so we better start wrapping up there. And apologies, well, we didn't get to all questions. Um, but as, as we close, um, uh, it's worth showing some uh, information. What we've got on screen there is a bit about the um, uh, the BRM qualifications from the BRM Institute, which um, which we deliver here at APMG on behalf of uh, on behalf of the institute. Um, so. Yeah, you've got the BRMP at the top there, which is a comprehensive foundation for BRMs at, um, at any experience level. And the CBRM is a slightly more advanced one uh, for those in more intermediate to advanced uh, level of experience. Um, and you can find out more um, at the web link there, but um, we will include that in the follow-up email as well. So don't worry about frantically jotting down links here. 
Okay, um, um, I think that's everything. So, so to close, let me first thank you, Jeremy and Pez, uh, for joining us today and sharing your experiences. It's been fantastic to have you with us um, and present a session with you both. So, um, is there any closing thoughts or recommendations uh, from each of you before we close? Um, nothing particular, but obviously, if you you know if you want to connect, um, me and Jeremy do try and organise free events, um, particularly in the UK, on a yearly basis in some capacity. Uh, so we'll continue doing that, but. Just link out, uh, link, reach us through through LinkedIn or whatever, and we can more than happy to have a, an additional chat, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, get likewise. If you're interested in the training, add me on LinkedIn, and we'll have a chat. Um, and yeah, we'll invite you to any free conferences or events that we put together. Thank Great you very stuff. much. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and just to, to everyone listening, we'll, we'll include um, uh, links to uh, Jeremy and Pez on LinkedIn in the follow up email as well. So lastly, thank you very much everyone for attending today um, and or of course if you're watching the recording, um, I do hope it's been useful, interesting and uh, valuable for, uh, for you and of course we look forward to welcoming you to future webinars. So thanks again everyone, thanks again Jeremy, Pez uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye.